Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Wednesday, May 25th. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to the stream to another Left Lens. Today, we have a very special guest. So as you're coming in, make sure you're liking the stream, sharing it. Make sure that you are subscribing to the channel and hitting that notifications bell. And as always, you know, please do support this work here at this channel and all the work that I do at patreon.com slash Danny Haifang. But with that said, I want to introduce our guests because we have a lot to talk about over the next hour. And uh, it is uh, economist Michael Hudson. He is the author of the new book, The Destiny of Civilization, Finance Capitalism, Industrial Capitalism, or Socialism. And I'll pull that up from his website uh, very soon. But I want to just say that Michael Hudson, is uh, he's been someone I've been following for quite some time. He has been making the rounds on uh, uh, various programs talking about political economy, and uh, he's one of the foremost voices of understanding political economy today. So hi, Michael. Good to be with you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Good to meet you, Danny. Very, very good to meet you. So I'm going to pull up uh, your new book in a second, just on your website so people know where to go. And I'll make sure to link that in the chat so people know where to get it. But I want to talk about first, so I mean, we're in a we're in a very I mean, we're in an economic catastrophe in a lot of ways, just currently. And there's a lot of talk about inflation and money. Prices are skyrocketing. One thing I really appreciate about your work is that you really do focus on political economy. And you have been talking a lot about finance capital and something called super imperialism, which you've written a book about and that has been updated several times, uh, even just last year. So I wanted to get your take on the role of finance capital uh, under this imperialist arrangement and in this time of the neoliberal era in the United States and across much of the West and the world. Like, What is finance capital's role? It, it seems so dominant now. It seems like the dominant class at this moment that really does control the levers of economic development. Uh, could you talk about what role it plays and how it has spurred the crises that we're going through today. And you could talk about inflation, but but I, I definitely want to just kick it to you there so our viewers can get an understanding of the economics and, and, and sort in the analysis of this. So I'll kick it to you. Well, most people think of uh, all kinds of capitalism as being the same. And uh, the assumption is that uh, industrial capitalism of the 19th century it, uh, somehow uh, was always uh, financialized because there were always banks. But financial capitalism, as you just pointed out, is a political uh, system. And as a political system, it's very different from uh, the industrial capitalism dynamic. Uh, in industrial capitalism, the whole aim or the hope of the industrial capitalists in the late 19th century, especially in Germany and Central Europe, was that banking would uh, no longer be uh, just usury. It wouldn't be just consumer lending uh, to exploit labor. It wouldn't be lending to government. Somehow uh, the financial system uh, would recycle the economy savings and money creation and credit into industrial production and would finance the means of production to uh, uh, make that productive instead of predatory and parasitic as it became. Uh, and that seemed to be the way that industrial capitalism was evolving up until World War I. Uh, everything changed after that. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, you had the financial system take over as a result of the crisis caused in the 1920s by the German reparations debt that couldn't be paid and the inter-ally debt uh, that uh, was in insisted upon to... Uh, uh, repay the United States uh, for the arms that it supplied Europe before its entry into World War I, well, the result was uh, a huge depression. The Allies said, well, we didn't expect to actually have to pay the United States. If we have to pay the United States, then we have to charge reparations on Germany. And for a decade, there was a debate between John Maynard Keynes and Harold Moulton and others saying that uh, these debts can't be paid. How are you going to handle 
uh, a situation where the debts can't be paid. And uh, uh, the the right the finance capitalists uh, were the uh, basically the uh, ancestors of today's neoliberals. They said any amount of debt can be paid by any country if it just lowers the living standards and squeezes labor enough. Uh, and that's what basically uh, the philosophy of the IMF ever since World War II. When third world countries can't pay the debt, the IMF comes in with an austerity program and say, uh, you have to uh, uh, lower wa uh, wages, you have to break up labor unions. If necessary, you have to have a, a democracy and you can't have a democracy unless you're willing to assassinate and arrest the labor leaders and uh, the advocates of land redistribution. Because a democracy means basically rule by the financial sector uh, centered in the United States. Uh, and so finance, finance capitalism, ever since uh, World War I, and especially World War II, and especially since 1980, is the nationalistic doctrine of American uh, banks uh, and the American 1%, the American financial sector that is sort of merged into a symbiotic unit with uh, finance, insurance, and real estate. and. Uh, other words, the one percent of the uh, uh, population. So, finance capitalism, instead of uh, trying to promote overall economic growth for the ninety-nine percent, instead of uh, financing the industrialization of an economy with rising productivity and rising living standards, finance capitalism is now cannibalizing the uh, in the uh, industrial sector. Uh, cannibalizing the corporate sector, uh, as uh, you're seeing in the United States. Finance capitalism is the uh, economic doctrine of deindustrialization uh, that has uh, 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 occurred in America, in England, and is now uh, occurring in, in uh, Europe. Well, the problem is, how do you uh, survive if you're not industrializing, if you're not producing your own uh, uh, means of subsistence, and uh, how are you going to get this from other countries? Well, the answer is uh, you don't go to war with them uh, like countries used to go to war with each other to grab uh, their money and their land. You uh, use finance as the new means of war. So finance capitalism is um, uh, the tactic of economic warfare by the United States against Europe, and uh, the global south uh, to sort of draw all of the uh, economic surplus of these countries in the form of debt service. Uh, and the debt service is supplied by basically economic rent seeking, uh, rum, uh, land rent, natural resource rent, uh, and just plain uh, interest charges uh, on the economy. So none of these uh, are really the result of industrial profits that are made by employing labor and uh, selling its products uh, at a markup. Uh, finance capitalism is not based on surplus value like industrial capitalism was. Uh, in fact, it uh, destroys uh, industry it, uh, and in cannibalizing industrial capital, it uh, basically dries out the economy uh, and uh, makes it uh, unable to uh, break even or uh, even to function. And in the United States today, for instance, uh, if you look at the balance sheets of the uh, uh, Standard and Poor 500, 92% of corporate revenue in the United States is spent on stock buybacks. You buy back your own stock or dividend payouts. Only 8% of corporate earnings are spent on new uh, capital investment, research and development, uh, factories, uh, machinery, uh, means of production to employ labor. So uh, the result is that you'll have companies like uh, General Electric and uh, uh, other major companies. Well, how did General Electric go broke? Uh, basically, uh, Jack Wells said, uh, let's use our income not to uh, continue to invest in making more uh, electronic uh, goods and services and appliances. Let's use it to buy uh, our own stock. That'll push up our stock. And uh, essentially, we'll just sell off our divisions and we'll use the money of selling off our uh, washing machine companies and uh, uh, stoves and uh, sell it off. And we'll just 
pay it to the stockholders. That'll push it up. And by the way, his uh, salary was based on uh, how much he could push up uh, the stock of GE, and he was paid in the form of uh, stock options. Well, all of this uh, is now the normal corporate uh, uh, behavior in the United States. And corporations are no longer led by uh, industrial engineers as they were uh, a few centuries ago, 19th and 20th century. Uh, they're led by financial engineers, by the chief financial officer. And the ideal of these corporations is to make money financially, not by industrial investments. So uh, on the narrow microeconomic level, finance capitalism is a way of basically selling out uh, a company and uh, giving the proceeds to the stockholders and the bondholders. But as a political system, it, uh, because it is so destructive of the economy, as you've seen in the United States and you've seen in Britain, deindustrializing, uh, it, it becomes uh, a belligerent uh, attempt to uh, make other countries uh, just as uh, equally paralyzed, to make other countries pay tribute to the United States and England and the, the financialized economies uh, by means of uh, financial engineering, by means of debt service, by means of uh, selling their uh, mineral resources, their public utilities, their land, their roads, uh, all to foreign investors, uh, basically, to, who borrow the money that's just simply created in the United States, and to save all of their money in the form their central bank uh, reserves in the forms of uh, loans to the U.S. Treasury, uh, holding treasury bonds, which is how uh, the international monetary system worked uh, until just a few months ago, uh, when everything changed. So, uh, if you're uh, England and America right now, you can look at uh, President Biden's speeches, and he mm -hmm. said, "Well, uh, China is our number one enemy because it's competing unfairly. China is uh, actually." Uh, subsidizing industrial development by having its own infrastructure. It gives free education instead of privatizing education and making its labor pay for it. Uh, it has uh, public uh, health instead of privatizing uh, social uh, medicine like we do in the United States and making employers and uh, workers pay for it. Well, industrial capitalism in the 19th century uh, was all in favor of strong government infrastructure. Uh, the ideal of industrial capitalism was to keep the, uh, the wage uh, costs of production down, not by reducing wages, but having government provide uh, basic infrastructure to cover the basic needs of employees. The governments would provide free education so that employers didn't have to pay for it. The governments would provide medical care uh, so that employees didn't have to pay for it, and employers wouldn't have to pay employees enough money to cover the education costs and to cover the medical care costs. The government would build roads and infrastructure and everything to facilitate the uh, overall cost of doing business by industrial capital. Well, finance capitalism is just the reverse. Finance capitalism wants to privatize and take uh, education, medical, uh, care, roads, uh, they turn the roads into toll roads, may take all of these and privatize them uh, and make them uh, financial uh, in, uh, corporations that will essentially pay out their economic rent uh, to the uh, bondholders and uh, the, the stockholders. And this economic rent adds to the cost of uh, education and uh, everything else that workers need to live on. So the result is to make it a high high cost economy. And that's what under that is why Biden has said uh, China and Russia are the America's enemies because the only way that America can, can succeed given our privatized economy, given the fact that Americans uh, have to pay up to 43% of their income for rent, uh, given the fact that 18% uh, of America's GDP is for uh, medical care, given the heavy student loan debt, only if other countries uh, tie themselves in the same knot, only if other countries impose the same economic overhead on their labor force and on their industry can there be equal competition. Uh, if uh, other countries have a mixed economy and are more efficient because 
they have uh, active government providing basic needs, that's uh, autocracy. And uh, mm -hmm. that's the opposite of democracy. Democracy is where everything is privatized and uh, ultimately the 1% own everything. Uh, autocracy is any government that's strong enough to uh, have its own public investment. Any government strong enough to tax or regulate the financial sector is called autocracy. So the United States uh, in the 19th century would be called an autocracy, uh, as I guess the Austrian school called it. Uh, civilization is basically uh, an autocracy. Uh, there never has been an unmixed economy without government regulation, without a government investment, uh, although Rome uh, began to get to that point at the uh, uh, end of its empire, and we all know what happened to it. Uh, so basically, uh, finance capitalism is uh, a predatory uh, international economic policy uh, aimed at draining the rest of the world, all to pay the uh, leading 1% of uh, wealth holders in the United States and their satellite uh, uh, oligarchy in uh, England and uh, a few European countries. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's, that was an incredible summary with so much in there. I mean, uh, what you describe, it, remind, it, it reminds me of what we at Black Agenda Report call it's like this great race to the bottom. Like that, that is what finance capital facilitates because it's, it's, it, you know, there's a lot of talk about outsourcing and production going from the U.S. and the West to other places, the global South, poor countries, oppressed nations. And all of it is underwritten by finance capital because it's this international monetary system that you describe, which is actually plundering the global South for super profits and also plundering the United States and the West economic base for super profits. So it's like the super profits come rolling in from all sides. And oftentimes the jingoists, the, 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 the chauvinists, they'll frame things as, oh, well, China is taking our jobs or uh, they, they rarely say Bangladesh or some other country that has that actually is being super exploited uh, in so many ways. But it's framed like that to uh, to distract us from everything that you described, the fact that this class and this policy is plundering from all sides. Well, you use the word super profit. And in a way, what is super profit? Super profit is what the classical economists called economic rent. It's over and above profit. Profits are made by employing labor. Uh, and basically, uh, that's not how most uh, wealth is created. Uh, well, in today's world, a financialized economy, wealth is not created by making profits by investing in factories and plant and equipment and employing labor to make a profit. It's made on uh, in getting a, a third world country, global south country in debt and saying, well, if you can't pay the debt uh, that uh, we've uh, uh, given you, uh, then you have to sell off your raw, raw materials, your land, uh, all of your natural monopolies. Uh, and m the way to make money in finance capitalism is to buy a by monopolies. And uh, the whole idea of industrial capitalism was uh, to get rid of economic rent. Uh, the main aim was to get rid of the landlord class that was the carryover from feudalism, uh, the uh, warrior, warlords that had conquered England, and France, and other countries. Uh, land was to be brought into the public domain. That was the first item in the Communist Manifesto. Uh, you uh, you uh, tax the land rent and then nationalize. Uh, and socialize uh, the land. Uh, the idea was to get rid of monopoly rent. Uh, so because uh, monopoly rent is unearned income uh, and to get rid, and essentially to get rid of uh, financial rent uh, of interest that is just uh, made, uh, as John Stuart Mill said, in, you make it in the sleep. If you're a bondholder or uh, a, a, land, a landlord, uh, you get the rents not from playing any productive service at all, but uh, making this money uh, in the sleep. And so that has nothing to do with profits. Uh, unfortunately, the national income accounts don't uh, label uh, the, uh, economic rent as a distinct category. Uh, they call uh, any income that someone makes, whether it's uh, Goldman Sachs and Citibank or uh, uh, General Electric uh, or uh, any country, they call it earnings. And the theory is that everybody earns what they make. 
But that wasn't uh, the idea of industrial capitalism. The idea of industrial capitalism is from the physiocrats and Adam Smith and John Stuart Mill and Marx uh, was uh, that uh, earnings were something that was actually made productively uh, with money by uh, employing labor to uh, produce a surplus that would uh, be reinvested. But uh, economic rent was unearned, uh, and that's why natural monopolies should all be kept in the public domain instead of uh, being available to be monopolized. So <laughs> like in America, when uh, Indiana uh, ran into trouble, it privatized, uh, sold out the roads to be made into a toll road. And now almost everybody avoids the toll roads and drives on the side roads. Uh, when Chicago uh, had uh, problems paying its uh, 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 local debt, they sold uh, the, the rights to the sidewalk and parking meters, uh, causing uh, vastly increasing the cost of living and doing business uh, if you live in downtown Chicago where you have to park a car. Uh, so uh, the, the ideal of Industrial capitalism was, uh, I guess, what uh, Schumpeter called creative destruction by lowering the cost of production. The way that a country would, uh, industrial country would uh, win out in the world market, first England, then the United States, Germany, uh, Japan, the way that they went out was by underselling competitors. But finance capitalism adds as much as it can uh, to the uh, cost of production. Uh, mm -hmm. and it, yes. uh, it adds as much as it can to the cost of living because instead of treating education and health care uh, as and transportation as uh, a public right, a natural human right, uh, it's all privatized by the one percent. Yeah, no, I mean it's it's so true. I mean, I, it, even in the Communist Manifesto, there's a section there where where Marx outlines the very idea. Of what socialism would look like and in it it's explicit in the 10 points about this is what how socialism will begin the commanding heights of the economy were uh, as you said that these natural uh monopolies they were going to be public owned like that that's the only way that you can have anything remotely socialist and now we've gone to the point where finance capital has usurped them, has, has completely privatized them or is attempting to with whatever is left of uh, the public domain, the public sector, so to speak, globally. And it, you bring up this really interesting point about the cost of everything going up, especially the cost of production. I mean, that that's for me, that's just seen in how a lot of these big corporations they have enormous amounts of debt now. I mean, corporate debt is at this astronomical level. And you think, well, look at all these super profits they're making. Look at all these huge profits they're making. At, we always hear all these corporations making these huge profits, but we rarely hear about all of the debt that these corporations are accumulating because of finance capital. And so it's really incredible. I, I, I mean, I love talking about this because it, it's these things that we don't hear about because finance capital really is writing the rules and they... They have such undue influence over the media and over so many things. Um, so, so I, I wanted to ask though about uh, you did mention China. So let's just jump there because this. I want to ask you a question because I have. I, I recently talked. I, I got into a debate with this. Uh, I don't even know if I want to call him a journalist, but he's a commentator, uh, Matt Stoller. He's very anti-China. And this is a talking point, especially on the farther right. But I would say that a lot of people think this. So a lot of people think China and Wall Street are merged together, that they work together to undermine workers across the world, especially in the capitalist epicenters, the finance capitalist epicenters, so to speak, U.S. and the Western countries. Could you talk about China and its monetary system? You mentioned it briefly about why the U.S. is so hostile right now, why Biden can't stop talking about competition and autocracy versus democracy. Could you talk about the differences in the monetary systems and how China treats uh, uh, finance? Because I think this is not really well understood and it has global implications, right? I think it has, it has huge implications because I think there's a general shift uh, in a direction of how how do we address this flailing dollar led uh, economy, global economy, imperialism, and and China's really at the center of this. So could you speak on this, if you would? 
Well, what uh, gets Americans so upset is that China's getting rich by doing exactly what the United States did in the 19th century. Uh, I've written a book, America's Protectionist Takeoff, where I describe the whole idea of uh, uh, American uh, protectionism was uh, tariff protection for its industry, government subsidize uh, research and development, government subsidy of industry by uh, having infrastructure uh, as a, a fourth uh, factor of production alongside land, labor, and capital. Uh, and uh, I, it was supposed to have uh, public banking. So uh, basically, uh, China, like the United States, said, we want to raise the living standards of labor, not because uh, uh, of an abstract uh, ideal, but because highly paid labor is more efficient labor. H uh, highly paid labor is more educated, it's better fed, it's healthier. And uh, the Americans in the 19th century pointed out that uh, America was the highest paid labor in the world, but it was also the most productive and high paid labor undersold pauper labor. Well, China uh, began uh, uh, under Mao with a, you'd look at pictures back in the 50s uh, and even early 60s, and you'd see masses of beggars. And I'd look at the pictures and I think, how on earth are they going to solve this problem? Well, they actually uh, did it. And China realized that in order to uh, uh, survive in the modern world, you had to have uh, well-paid, well-housed, well-fed, well-educated uh, uh, labor, and uh, uh, they've done it. The difference is that uh, where um, America uh, had uh, kept money creation in the uh, hands of the treasury ever since uh, the greenbacks uh, in America's Civil War, uh, uh, basically the government created money. But, but in 1913, uh, J.P. Morgan and uh, the financial sector got together and they said, we've got to get government out of money and credit. If we can control money and credit, we can control the economy. So uh, uh, they uh, convinced uh, uh, President Wilson to have the Federal Reserve. They said, we're not even going to let uh, a Treasury official be on the Federal Reserve. We're going to move the Federal Reserve ba banks out of Washington. We're going to have the key uh, bank in New York where Wall Street is. The ideal of a Federal Reserve is uh, to make a centrally planned economy. But, and America is a much more centralized planned economy than China, but its centralized planning is on Wall Street by the financial sector, by the leading financial corporations instead of the government. So whereas America took uh, uh, economic forward planning out of the hands of the government uh, in uh, 1913, uh, China has kept uh, the financial system in the hands of the government. That means that uh, let's look at how, how these two countries create money in a different way. Uh, since the uh, Obama depression began in 2008, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve has created a tidal wave of credit all into the stock market and the bond market. All of this recent uh, zero interest uh, policy, this flooded, this uh, $9 trillion of Federal Reserve credit has only been to support uh, uh, the banks, real estate prices, bond and stock prices, to support property prices. That's not what they do in China. Uh, although uh, the prosperity that China has created uh, has uh, increased uh, housing prices uh, and uh, there has been private credit increasing housing prices, China has kept money creation in the hands of the government itself. So that when the government creates money, it, it, it uh, creates it to uh, finance the creation of uh, factories, plant and equipment, dams, transportation infrastructure, public housing. Uh, it, it doesn't create money to uh, lend to financial speculators and stockholders uh, to increase uh, uh, their holdings. It creates actual tangible means of production. Now, of course, if you create tangible means of production and employ labor and uh, uh, have high speed, speed railroads and research uh, laboratories, uh, you're going to overtake countries that are busy closing uh, down the factories and uh, uh, cutting back uh, uh, research and development because they want quick payouts. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the, the chief public utility to be kept in the public domain 
China realizes and has realized from the beginning is uh, the banking system and uh, credit creation. Uh, even so, there's still private uh, credit creation to some extent. Uh, and they've also let uh, some participation by American uh, Wall Street firms, such as uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, because it's hoped uh, it wants to avoid war. And it, it hopes that it can, uh, by providing opportunities for financial profit uh, to American companies, that will somehow uh, convince Wall Street to uh, resist the Biden administration's uh, uh, race hatred of China uh, and the uh, attempt to uh, uh, move towards uh, towards a new war uh, against China. Uh, obviously, uh, the uh, the assumption that China made that seemed rational at the time was, well, American economies run by Wall Street, so if we can have Wall Street uh, say we're doing just fine with China, everything's going to be okay. But uh, the uh, Wall Street and the Federal Reserve Bank and the Treasury have not even been consulted on uh, the, uh, this year's war, uh, uh, NATO war with, uh, U with Russia uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, all, it's uh, uh, Blinken and Biden and the, the neocons uh, basically are uh, uh, waging a war with, uh, that is sidelined uh, finance. And the result is to create the, the present 20% uh, crash uh, in stock market prices and uh, uh, the parallel decline in, bo in bond prices. So finance capitalism is uh, intrinsically self-destructive, whereas industrial capitalism is self-expansive, finance capitalism is self-destructive. Uh, and that's exactly uh, what's happening today. And that's uh, what China wants to involve, wants to avoid by basically following the logic of uh, what used to be called industrial capitalism, but everybody called, said by the 19th century, uh, final decades, people were saying, oh, what, how is capitalism evolving toward? Everybody used the word socialism. Uh, and it wasn't only the Marxists that were using the word socialism. There were Christian socialists, libertarian socialists, anarchist socialists, uh, all different kinds of socialists. Uh, uh, they, the, the, the recognition was you have to have a, a, the government sponsorship of a balanced and fair economic development. And you have to prevent uh, people from getting rich, not by providing any productive service at all, but just by being good ripoff artists. And uh, that's basically what finance capitalism is, a opportunity for ripoff artists to get rich uh, by... Uh, taking money away from the 99% into their own hands. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's that's exactly what has happened, and and we've seen the differing results. I mean, between China and the United States since that crash, I mean, China was able to sustain growth despite the worldwide economic crisis, as you said. Living standards still rose. I think wages were going up something like seven to ten percent every year after the financial crisis, uh, and a lot of that was because jobs. I've spoken to people in China, and they say, "Well, in in China, in wages in industry, if you go work for a factory, they tend to rise. Like they tend to go up. And actually, workers want to go there, and sometimes they don't want to leave, even though China is trying to move more into the high tech sector and." Uh, the service sector, their economy is changing, but uh, still a lot of people want to stay in the factory jobs because it's paying, you know, it pays and it has some of these benefits and subsidies that uh, are kind of are very alien here now. Right? I tell people there's a housing allowance. They're like, what's that? Like, how, how could you say that? It's China. China's horrible. It's like, well, you know, factory workers have a housing allowance. Like, how are you going to reproduce? We look at Marx and China's very big on Marx. Look at what Marx was saying. He said, you got to reproduce the worker. You got to make sure that the worker has what they need. Like that's the bare minimum of what any, any economy should do. But that's what capitalism was originally supposed to do. You reproduce the worker so you can extract the surplus. Uh, finance capital is such a great race to the bottom that workers uh, oftentimes are not reproducing themselves. There's a huge crisis of people of life expectancy and all sorts of things that um, didn't used to be characteristic of capitalism. Standards used to rise as, as capitalism developed more advanced. But I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned this current crisis, right, of the dollar 
and finance capital kind of being sidelined. I, I find this very interesting because finance capital is so hegemonic and it has so much influence over Washington and Europe. But what you're saying is very true because, and we just see it, that there's just a catastrophe. There's this huge inflation and there's the crisis of the dollar. Like what's happening here? What, how, how come it seems that the further and further the United States gets into this proxy war with Russia over Ukraine, the more and more it deepens its involvement and it's been a it's been a long involvement it's not just since february but ever since this time ever since march we've seen just this economic like almost like this impending economic collapse so so what's happening here why is it that finance capital is sidelined and and uh, uh how do you see this going with the ukraine crisis especially what, around the dollar what do you mean by crisis of the dollar well, it seems like that there's a move away, like the uh, the United States is imposing, is trying to impose its hegemony through its foreign policy, through these sanctions, but it's having this blowback effect where now you have countries seeking alternatives to the dollar and the United States is uh, uh, seems to be more economically vulnerable, even though it's expanding and trying to dominate. It's It's this very... It's like this contradiction that feels very unstable and it feels like the dollar is artificially inflating itself as it is also dealing with the fact that uh, there is no end game here in Ukraine. It seems like this is going this is to, to mess with a big country like Russia and its relationship to Europe seems like it's moving toward economic catastrophe, like, like an economic crisis uh, if there's not already one underfoot. No, that's not what's happening with the dollar at all. Uh, it, people, uh, with all of the emphasis on America's uh, war against Russia to try to uh, break it away from China before going to war with China, uh, the first thing, the first uh, thing that America wanted to do was uh, to lock in its control over Europe because that's where the money was. That's where the easiest uh, way to get things is. You want to uh, take over the richest economies in the world and lock them into the United States. Uh, and that means taking over the Eurozone, England, and Japan. And the dollar has been soaring against these currencies. The, uh, or put, to put it the other way, the euro has been plunging towards $1 per euro. The pound sterling has been plunging to $1 per sterling. Uh, the Japanese yen has been plunging even more. So there's a huge movement to safety into the dollar. The Americans have successfully destroyed the bank, the basis of European industry. They've finally beaten Germany. They've left Germany uh, with, without uh, energy and uh, GDP in any country. You can it compared to energy per worker. Uh, and uh, basically the productivity uh, that makes goods, it's basically embodied energy. Uh, and Europe has been getting its energy from uh, Russia in the form of gas uh, and oil. Well, the United States has asked Europe to commit economic suicide, basically by saying, don't buy uh, Russian gas, uh, uh, wait, wait three or four years, spend $5 billion on building new ports so that you can import American liquefied natural gas at seven or eight times uh, the price. And meanwhile, uh, let your uh, uh, chemical industry, your car industry, uh, your basic industries uh, go bankrupt. Take it on the chin for America. Uh, and uh, Europe said, okay, not Europe, but the politicians that America have meddled in European politics to promote uh, to sign on the dotted line for uh, treaties uh, the, uh, are, have uh, made that decision. So uh, even if the Europeans uh, don't want to commit suicide, uh, America has uh, its proxy politicians in. It's Tony Blair's, uh, you could say, uh, in the head of the Social Democratic Parties. Uh, it's head, uh, the head of the advocates of uh, pollution and global warming. It's the head of the Green Party. Uh, you have in England, you have uh, Boris Yeltsin, and in Japan, you have uh, 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 
leaders who are going to, willing to continue to sacrifice Japan's growth uh, to serve the U.S. So uh, these countries, uh, investors in Europe, England, Japan, are moving their money into the United States, especially because the United States is raising its interest rates uh, uh, through the Federal Reserve, uh, and other, and it's telling Japan and Europe not to do it. So your, the eurozone has very low rates. People are borrowing at under one percent, moving it into the United States to make two, two and a half percent. Japan uh, has, uh, has almost uh, interest-free money from the central bank. It's moved its money into the U.S. So the U.S. dollar is—I won't say it's soaring against these currencies. Other currencies uh, in the U.S. orbit are collapsing against the dollar because they're following. Uh, U.S. advice. Uh, so I think when you say other countries are breaking away, you're talking about the bulk of the world, uh, 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 Central China, Asia uh, yeah. and Latin America and Japan. But you, uh, it, the key to the present, uh, the new Cold War II, is America has to uh, achieve its uh, almost dictatorial dominance over Europe uh, and Japan uh, and uh they, uh, it's uh, client uh, oligarchies and client dictatorships, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, w without realizing that uh, this is uh, American democracy is where the leaders of the whole world follow what the United States tells mm -hmm. them to do because the United States is identifies itself as the democratic center. So democracy no longer means a political system where uh, voters get to determine. Uh, who's in charge. Democracy is the policy dictated by the United States safe State Department. And any country that uh, goes its own way or develops the power potentially to go its own way, such yeah. as China uh, and Russia are doing, is counted an autocracy because that uh, is uh, an independence from the American democracy. So you, you have to realize the Orwellian rhetoric that we're uh, dealing with uh, in today's world. So uh, democracy is autocracy and autocracy is democracy, you could say. Yeah. Uh, 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 the, the question is, of course, uh, will uh, the world really break into two halves? And it looks like it is breaking into parts. And there will be the US and its allies, US, Europe, uh, uh, and Japan uh, against uh, the Eurasian core that will uh, go hand in hand with uh, Africa and Latin America and uh, other Asian countries, uh, who able to rely entirely on trade and investment among themselves. Uh, and the United States, by isolating, uh, seeming to isolate Russia and China and uh, Iran uh and other countries uh, actually is isolating it, its own dollar area uh america uh europe and japan from the rest of the world uh so it's there is an iron curtain but it's not to keep other countries out it's to keep its own allies within within yeah do you i have a question do you see this succeeding because china and russia i mean we know we've been hearing a lot about russia's relationship with europe and just how deep its energy sector is with Europe and how that relationship is. That's a very difficult relationship to break economically for Europe, although Europe is doing everything it can. Everything you've described, it made me think about how throughout this crisis, Europe with through because of the uh, you know dominance of the U.S. and just listening to whatever the U.S. said was actually going way above and beyond what the U.S. would commit to in terms of Russia and how economically they would wage this kind of uh, warfare. But China and Russia, I mean, Russia, of course, with its energy and its natural resources, but China, it, it, I think, in a more broad kind of portfolio, has so much to offer to Europe. Do you think that this will succeed, this attempt to isolate because Europe? Because Europe, it sounds like, I mean, it has been going the road of austerity for many, many, many years. But this seems like such a huge step in that direction that uh, it, it, Europe could look very much like the United States very soon. Do you see this working given the how China has so much to offer? It already has a lot of countries in Europe, maybe not the, 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 the biggest of the clients uh, like the UK, for example, but a lot of European countries have big relationships with China. Even the UK does, despite all of the nonsense, all of the new Cold War stuff. 
What do you think? Do you think this will work? There's the one trap that futurists tend to fall into, and that's imagining that countries are going to act in their self-interest. Uh, this is what uh, the mistake Stalin made uh, with Hitler. He thought uh, if Germany attacks Russia uh, in World War II, uh, it's obviously going to lose. Uh, no sane country would attack a Russia in uh, just as uh, winter's coming, uh, but Hitler attacked Russia, uh, much to the surprise. Uh, you'd think that uh, if you tried to say, what is a logical future? Let's go back to uh, the 1991. Uh, when uh, the Soviet Union uh, self-dissolved uh, uh, into parts. The whole idea, the dream at that point was uh, Russia, Russia's leaders uh, thought, well, if, if now that we can have peace, we're not going to have a war budget anymore. Uh, Europe uh, is going to invest in us and help us rebuild a, a rationalized, efficient industry, and we will trade with Europe, and we'll both get rich on mutual trade. Well, this terrified the United States. It said, oh my, we, want to, we Americans want to be the beneficiaries of Russia. We don't want to trade with it. We want to carve it up and privatize it and uh, take over and uh, basically have Wall Street take over its uh, oil resources, its gas resources, uh, its nickel resources, its electric utilities. Uh, the last thing America wanted was this uh, symbiotic uh, mutual gain between Europe and Russia. Uh, and I think that uh, Putin and uh, most of the leaders at that time expected that uh, Europe would act in its self-interest and uh, they could both end up gaining. But that's not what happened, obviously. Uh, Europe uh, followed uh, American uh, dictates and continues to because, it's, again, its leaders follow, uh, the, its leaders are really just like Zelensky in uh, Ukraine. They're just as dependent on what the State Department dictates to them to do as uh, uh, Zelensky is. And uh, they there's something evangelistic about it. Uh, the, the Europeans I've spoken to, uh, really and the English also, really believe that uh, uh, America is the land of the future and uh, that neoliberalism, that finance capitalism somehow uh, is going to be uh, an ideal of private enterprise. They, they, they bought the rat poison. They've eaten the rat poison, and they actually believe it, and they think of themselves not simply as servants of the United States following what it's uh, doing, or as the Pakistan former prime minister said a few weeks ago, uh, slaves of the United States uh, policy. Uh, they actually are evangelistic promoters of uh, neoliberalism and as sort of disciples uh, or uh, just... Uh, bishops, you could say, really like like a religion. And they treat uh, the American-centered neoliberalism as the new religion. And for them, it's, a cru it's literally a crusade uh, against uh, uh, Russia and Europe. And I think this has shocked uh, Putin and uh, uh, I would imagine the Chinese leadership also, thinking, how can Europe uh, be so... Uh, so completely unrealistic, and how can its media lie so uh, constantly about what's really happening in Ukraine? How can Europe de uh, 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 deify the neo-Nazis in Ukraine as freedom fighters, as heroes, as uh, wonderful uh, uh, people to be supported, uh, supportive? I think this has been such a shock uh, to the Russian leadership that they, uh, they realize, finally, that, uh, well, Europe is not going to act in its self-interest. There is not going to be any mutual gain. Uh, uh, Europe, uh, again and again, is just going to grab any money that we have there, like they've grabbed our, yeah. uh, our uh, for, uh, whatever was in European or American banks. There's really nothing we can do. We, uh, so there's been a fundamental reorganization uh, with, uh, with Russia and the rest of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meaning not only with China, but with Iran, with India, uh, with all of the other Eurasian countries. So in that sense, the United States has brought about exactly what it feared, the whole rest of the world going its own way productively uh, in a uh, uh, capital investment way, living, raising living standards, things that democracy are supposed to do. Well, in the United States, uh, we really don't have democracy because 
uh, the political parties are controlled by the donor class, the 1%. That's what the Citizens United Supreme Court ruling meant. Uh, and the United States is left to uh, without any means of self-support. And uh, Europe will be left without any means of self-support. At some point, Europe may uh, say, gee, we made a mistake. Maybe we should have tried to profit from Russia because everybody else is profiting with uh, getting Russian gas and nickel and uh, China and other countries are rebuilding Russian industry. And we could have had our car industry build up uh, Russia, but we don't have a car industry anymore because it doesn't have uh, the gas that it needs and the raw materials and titanium it needs uh, from Russia. So now we've seen uh, other countries replace us. And so uh, Europe has been rendered pretty much obsolete. And even if it says we made a mistake, let's be friends again. I don't think uh, Russia or other countries uh, will trust it, mainly because they can afford not to trust it. They say, why take a risk? We're trusting yeah. Europe somehow uh, may not just continue to be America's poodle. Uh, why take a risk? Why not just say we're doing just fine the way we are? Why not just work with each other peacefully? And uh, all that the United States can do about this is threaten to bomb, uh, to bomb it. And uh, the way to uh, uh, stay away from uh, this threat is simply to say, look, you go your way, we'll go our way. Uh, uh, and to have enough of a military between them to uh, defend themselves against uh, uh, the American uh, potential military attack that despite the almost 800 military bases the United States have, if the United States is not getting foreign exchange from these countries anymore, uh, the dollar with the euro and the yen and the sterling will all go way down against the Eurasian currency block. And they're going to move into a common block with their own counterpart to the IMF, their own counterpart to the World Bank, their own trade organization, and the world will be split into two parts, uh, just like the world split when uh, the Roman Empire fell apart and uh, the East went forward, uh, Western Europe went down. Uh, this is really the final uh, submergence of, uh, uh, of Western Europe. Yeah, I mean, you have more activity now, BRICS plus, right? Brick, the BRICS countries are trying to move forward and. Uh, add more partners and, and expand uh, their financial operations. I mean, the, the, I mean, this is there's so many multilateral institutions, mainly led by China, with Russia's heavy involvement and in other countries that that are building kind of like this independent monetary system and economic development system that that can, as you said, avoid the risks. I mean, it, the Ukraine crisis is such a huge deal in part because of how geopolitics everything you were saying, like geopolitics plays such a big role. What the United States has done and what Europe has done during this Ukraine crisis is show countries like Russia and China that they, they, they not only cannot be trusted, but it's almost a guarantee that not only will this Ukraine situation have no quick ending, right? There's no like we're pulling out every we revert. You, you don't, the ball has is rolling and you can't, they, they can't catch it. They're not going to be able to stop what they're doing. There's so many issues with that. But they've even escalated the situation. You have countries like Finland and Sweden saying, we're going to join NATO. You have just so many, just all of these uh, points that show that the United States and Europe, they can't be trusted. They, they how, what, 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 what are you to do other than make sure that you can keep the, the right, as China says, to sovereign economic development safe and the only way you do that is by is by increasing that sovereign part of that the sovereignty and i think russia learned a big lesson here i mean you mentioned those assets that were stolen i mean they were just stolen it was it was a it was you know much bigger you know uh, afghanistan had the same situation happen to it but with russia it was it, it was probably the biggest problem with all of the economic moves that were made against russia the the assets being stolen right out from under you i mean that's a that's a huge blow economically and I, I facilitated so much change, but I wanted to, and you know, this last question, because I feel like uh, a lot of these developments are leading to, I, I, I think it is a positive thing that we see countries like China, Russia, increase the sovereignty of their economic development models. Talk, talk, can you end with talking about socialism and, you know, where do you see this concept of socialism going as a, as an economy, as like a political economy. We know China 
has its model. Other countries are trying their own models. But what what do you think are its prospects now in this environment? Because uh, uh, China has its particular model. It seems like a lot of countries want to emulate that. You see Cuba and other countries wanting to understand how to do what China has done because it, it is an economic miracle in a lot of ways. You were talking about how China was living, how people were living in China just in the 60s and 70s. It's just a completely different situation. What do you see the, of the prospects of it in this? This is just a very chaotic environment, the geopolitics, imperialist, finance capital. It's creating all of this chaos. What do you think the prospects are? And, and, and could you, I guess, enlighten our audience about, about socialism and, and, and your work on it? Well, socialism is really how industrial capitalism of the 19th century was supposed to evolve. Everybody thought that it was going to evolve into a, a more democratic system because the first aim of industrial capitalism, the, what it really needed politically was to get rid of the landlord class because there's no way that, as uh, David Ricardo pointed out, there's no way that England could become the workshop of the world if you let the landlord class uh, continue to get more and more land rent and uh, force uh, uh, labor to pay more and more for its food. Uh, today, it's the housing as well as food. Uh, there's no way that it could be uh, competitive. So uh, in order to get rid of the landlord class, you had to get rid of the House of Lords in England and the upper house in every European country, because the upper house, the Senate, uh, were, were controlled by the hereditary landlords. And so industrial capitalism backed democracy. And that and already by 1848, uh, the year that the Communist Manifesto was written, that led to revolutions all over European countries, getting rid of the old, beginning to get rid of the old aristocracy. Well, uh, the Rontiers fought back, and actually it was, wasn't was until World War I that uh, the monarchies were overthrown and the aristocracies connected to the, to, uh, the monarchies. And uh, land no longer was owned by a hereditary class. It was democratized, but it was democratized on credit, and you had the banking system uh, replay the role that the landlord class had played uh, before. And the bankers were the new rentier class. The bankers were the new people whose interest charges and debt service and uh, privatization uh, of uh, uh, economic rents uh, prevented economies from underselling uh, non rentier uh, economies. So socialism was a, a basically getting rid of the free lunch. Marx uh, described uh, ca uh, the uh, uh, capitalism as being revolutionary because he said what was revolutionary was getting rid of all of the unnecessary cost of production. And that meant the unnecessary rentiers, the rent seekers, the, uh, uh, the coupon clippers, the, the uh, financiers, uh, and the monopolists. And uh, socialism was uh, uh, the one thing everybody could agree that socialism was, was getting rid of this parasitic class that was not necessary for uh, economies to grow and actually whose takings slowed uh, the economy. Uh, socialism was to free economies and free markets from rent seeking, not free them for rent seeking, which is what uh, the anti-classical reaction and the uh, uh, late uh, after the 1890s uh, uh, was for. It was to get rid of uh, uh, free lunch uh, income, whereas finance capitalism is all about how to get a free lunch if you're a member of the 1%. So uh, in one sense, uh, socialism is, is freeing economies from the legacy of feudalism, which is fought back in the modern world into a kind of neo-feudalism operating through uh, financial control, not simply land ownership and uh, monopoly ownership. Uh, and uh, uh, China has been able uh, to get rid of this. Uh, uh, it, and, and at the same time, avoid the central planning uh, that gave socialism a bad name under Stalinism uh, because uh, China said, well, let a hundred flowers bloom. And we're going to, we realize that we can't plan all sorts of innovations because there are so many possibilities of uh, productive innovations. We're going to let people get rich by being creative, by being productive, by adding, but we're not going to let them get super rich. They, they can get pretty rich. But then at a certain point, uh, they're so rich that they're getting rid of a, a monopoly. We're going to uh, uh, sort of 
cut down the uh, uh, the high uh, grains of uh, of wheat, uh, as they say. So uh, they've got a sort of uh, consensus uh, government where uh, this occurs. Uh, other countries uh, will have great difficulty putting this in place because there really isn't any economic doctrine of socialism uh, that's uh, been, occur uh, been, been developed uh, recently. There's been uh, just an out of hand rejection of all discussion of what socialism really was and uh, what makes a socialist economy more efficient than a finance capitalist economy. Uh, and that really is the key. If, if countries, uh, if economic uh, theory would, would talk about what makes a socialist country more efficient, lower cost, with higher living standards, uh, then it wouldn't be economics anymore because economics are what gets published in the University of Chicago uh, sensorial uh, economic journals. I don't know what you should call it, futurism or reality economics. Uh, there has to be a new discipline that our countries are going to develop to uh, try to explain how to uh, think about developing a world that uh, doesn't have uh, parasites in it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so true. There's just, uh, I, I mean, what you were saying about all of this, it's just, you know, um, yeah, it just, it just gets you thinking, I mean, with, with, with what, what China has done, to be able to uh, control these forces. You see it in the tech sector, especially now. You see it with this common prosperity drive. Like there is a, a drive to control these forces that can, as industrial capitalism found out of, of the old, of, in America and Europe, you let those forces get out of control and it and then finance capital turns everything serious. And, and China has prevented that. And, and I think it's a huge, you don't hear it even in like the Bernie Sanders social democracy, you don't hear them talk about this. They they'll say like socialism is when you have Medicare for all, but it's not just that. It's how, as you were saying, how do you what 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 are the forces that need to be arrested? What are the forces that need to be strengthened to be able to to ensure that the public good and and, and public wealth is protected? That that's not in the discussion. It's still not in the discussion. I mean, it's not in the discussion even among the most so-called progressive left they don't talk about it like that because as you said earlier it's like autocracy or authoritarianism or something when a government is strong in the interests of economic development for people it's almost like that finance capital has has dominated even just the idea of it and, and the idea of what socialism is and what it could be but i was uh michael do you have any do you have uh, like five, 10 more minutes for a couple of questions. We had some in the audience sure. and I think one of them is very good and I wanted to know what your your take on it is. Thank you for the super chat uh, of on Avgard. Uh, so they said that the People's Republic of China has 3.3 .3 trillion in USD uh, foreign exchange reserves. So what measures, I know that you've done a lot of work in China, you've done a lot of work um, about around this. He's this person's asking what measures should the central government make to ensure they don't get seized, just uh -huh. like how the U.S. sees Russia's uh, foreign exchange reserves. But hey, I'll, I'll let you answer that because I think that's a great question. Well, I bet this is just what they're discussing right now in China uh, because of the covid. Uh, I haven't gone there since uh, 2019 uh, because uh, I'd have to be isolated in a hotel room for two weeks. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm not party to their discussions, but they're obviously worried that the Americans can do uh, to them just what it did to Russia. What are they going to do? They need to keep some dollars just to uh, intervene in the foreign exchange market to stabilize their exchange rate. Uh, but they don't need uh, too many dollars. And in fact, uh, my, uh, I, my, uh, the third edition of my super imperialism uh, is just uh, coming out in Chinese now. Uh, the first edition sold about 60,000 copies there uh, and was uh, the first book of mine translated into China. So, uh, and that was all about this question that you asked. So uh, this is very much uh, uh, in discussion now. Uh, how do they uh, with, uh, run down their uh, dollar holdings and what are they going to replace it with? Well, in principle, they can replace it with holding each other's currencies, uh, rubles and uh, 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 Indian currency and Pakistan currency, uh, and 
with gold because gold doesn't have uh, a liability attached to it. It's it's a pure asset. Uh, they're looking for things that they can. Uh, they're looking to de-dollarize. Uh, the world. The whole world is now. How do uh, America has uh, or Biden has killed the dollar standard. He, this was the America's free lunch, being able to print dollars and uh, never have to pay them. And now countries are all going to be dumping the dollars. They realize that America is just a gangster state uh, financially. And uh, uh, obviously they're going to uh, uh, dump the dollars. And uh, this probably will push up uh, China's exchange rate and countries selling the dollars will increase their exchange rate against the dollar and that will hurt their relative exports. So I think they're trying to figure out how can we all do this uh, together uh, and uh, keep a rough parity among our own currencies while uh, really uh, de-dollarizing. Uh, I don't know what they're doing, but uh, you can be sure this is uh, what is on the forefront of everybody's mind there. Indeed, indeed. No, it's it's a huge question. I mean, it, it really is trying to unravel and get 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 oneself out of this hegemon. It's been a hegemonic system, the dollar system. It's 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 something that you cannot escape. And and, and there's been so much unfair. I feel like unfair condemnation and criticism of China and other countries trying to go their own path uh, for just their participation is something you need to participate in right now to survive absent of another system right absent of another so so it's uh it's it's a it was a great question and i think that answer is, is very very good last question i mean this isn't so related to what we're talking about but it is a, i think it's a good super chat a pretty good i think a good question i think it gets into economics too what are the chances that china will simply not open back up for tourists for the next 10 years or so so looking at this long term because of covid-19 obviously um I mean, in my opinion, I don't know what you think, Michael. My opinion of that is, I, from what I learned about China, China is a huge like domestic tourism industry, and uh, foreign tourism is very important, of course. But um, I, I don't know. For me, it feels like it's going to open up before that. I, I don't know. It seems like the economic situation, it's very the the COVID nineteen restrictions are they're difficult to continue on permanently. But what do you think? Like, do you think that China could uh, maintain this uh, kind of hard travel restrictions for long? I hope not. I want to go back. So <laughs> uh, I need to go back and learn more. But I don't know. What do you think? Michael? Well, I asked that very question of uh, the universities that I'm associated with uh, yesterday. We had a long discussion and uh, the answer, nobody has a clue. Uh, they oh, don't. Uh, uh, they've been criticized in the West for avoiding a COVID, but there's no discussion in America uh, or Europe of long COVID. And now that, uh, there's a report that a million Americans have long COVID, and it really seems awful. It's uh, uh, your IQ goes down by 10%. And it's yeah. almost like inheriting a trust fund. You're, you're stupefied uh, yeah. as a result of it. Uh, it uh, adds all, so, uh, they're tired. Uh, some professors yeah. I know there uh, say that they're ad they're, they still have not fully recovered. Uh, from months and months ago, COVID, Same. they're still at very low energy. Uh, yeah. There's no way of knowing uh, uh, this. It, it doesn't look good. Uh, and if, if the thought of uh, staying in, you know, traveling all the way over there, uh, staying in a, a isolated hotel uh, for two weeks just to have a few days of meeting and then come back and be isolated again, uh, yeah. nobody has a clue, but it doesn't look good. No, it doesn't. And I, I myself know many, I've avoided COVID unironically like the plague. Like I, I am so lucky not to have caught it. And it, I, and part of it is I don't want exactly what you're saying, long COVID. I don't want that. I don't want that in my life. And I feel like, you know, I know so many people who have gotten COVID-19 and they lived through it. And while they had it, it was, you know, it was awful. It was bad, but they lived. But now they have all of these other symptoms. Like I know people who had their like entire lives kind of turned upside down because they just can't get the energy back or the motivation or uh, whatever it is that the breath, you know, it has an effect on your breathing and, and in mental health. And there's so many aspects of long COVID that are difficult to understand. And yeah. I think China, you know, uh, 
at one point it was like a 21 day. I know people who are traveling there who go there often and they were traveling there and staying 21 days, you know, in a quarantine hotel. I mean, you know, uh, China's done such a great job, you know, addressing COVID, containing COVID as best that they can under these circumstances. And so, well, of course, I have my own deep desires to, to go back. I totally understand why they would, why the government mm -hmm. and why the people there who support this policy, why they would be very careful because you have, a, in China, the population is so huge. If, if they did what the United States did, I think the recent estimates are like 1.7 million would die. And then how many would have long COVID? Millions upon millions more yep. because the yep. case numbers would be astronomical yep. and through the roof. I'm sure they're watching what happens in North Korea, which has just yeah. had the outbreak. I mean, that's sort of an example. The difference, of course, is that China is in is uh, inoculating uh, people, and there are all yeah. sorts of uh, uh, medical uh, pills. The Chinese have sent me uh, many many kinds of medicine in case I get COVID. Uh, great, like, amazing. Um, so uh, before we depart, Michael, I'll I'll stay on for another 15 minutes or so. But I definitely want you to plug like whatever you'd like to plug now. I, I'll, I'll pull up the book again and your website. Um, so if there's anything you'd like to plug, please, everyone, um, keep liking the stream, keep sharing and subscribing to the channel, all that good stuff, supporting the work at patreon.com. But Michael, is there anything you would like to No, yes, I, All my articles are on my website, michael-hudson.com. Uh, and I'm also on, uh, like as you, I'm on Patreon. Uh, and they can join on Patreon, and I uh, have an ongoing discussion there. So uh, the website, Patreon, and uh, my favorite sites where I publish on are Naked Capitalism, The Saker, uh, Counterpunch. Uh, my articles are usually on a lot of these uh, different websites. So, uh, and you're showing it now. So, yep. just, uh, and uh, the, the books are available on Amazon or Ex Libris. Uh, yeah, you, you can all buy them. Uh, other, they're uh, well printed and uh, priced not very expensively. Great. Well, uh, this was a great conversation, Michael. Thanks so much for coming. We will have to talk again as things continue to develop. Um, so thanks so much. And sure. everyone stick around. It's good, good, good to be here, Dan. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So that was a great conversation with the great Michael Hudson. He taught me some things. I love learning. Political economy is a passion of mine. So thanks, everyone, for coming. Please stick around. I'll be on for another 10 minutes or so. Um, please do, you know, at the end of the month, uh, please do like the stream, subscribe to the channel, make sure that you're sharing this around. Uh, and I'm still about uh, th three to four subscribers short of my goal for this month. Uh, at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. I uh, was it for 10. I think I've gotten six. So amazing contributions. Thanks so much. But if you can continue to support my work, I'm getting very close to my goal. But of course, the end of the month is coming and people are making decisions. So please do support my work. Patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. It supports these streams. It supports my articles and all the other work that I'm doing. I learned a lot today from Michael, uh, from Michael Hudson um, about economics. You know, I try to study it as much as I can, uh, but there's a lot going on uh, in this world. So much, you know, we, it, today, right? Everyone is reeling from the shooting that happened in Oval, Ovalde, Texas. I think it's called the school, right? You almost, I think almost twenty. I think twenty people. Is it twenty people? Like nineteen children, a teacher. Uh, killed in a mass shooting. This is just 10 days after the white supremacist who killed, uh, what was it, uh, seven, eight people and uh, injured overall, I think something like 10, right? Like in a black community at Tops in Buffalo, New York. I mean, what we were talking today is very relevant, right? Finance capitalism, the race to the bottom, what we're talking about, the results of that, the conditions that that brings definitely fuels it's not a coincidence i don't think that a lot of these mass shootings have occurred in the last 40 50 years where finance capital has usurped much of the capitalist economy is the hegemonic force and has created conditions of just utter misery a great race to the bottom and that's what we're seeing i think i think we're seeing what the result of that is now mass shootings themselves are not necessarily just 
out of economic rebellion. I don't believe that. I don't believe the white supremacists, that was what it was about. I don't believe that, the, you know, as, as the motive force, though, however, if you look at, at the ground level, the kind of chaos, the social dislocation, the alienation, and the normalization of violence, because fi as we were talking about finance capital, finance capitalism, neoliberal capitalism requires endless war. And so this normalization of violence, this normalization of white supremacy in a broad spectrum, right? This militarization of the world. Uh, everyone talks about the gun lobby, but no one's talking about the military industrial complex, but they're totally related, intimately related. You can't have one without the other, right? The military industrial complex would not exist where not, and the gun lobby would not exist without each other because really what it's all about is about profiteering from an environment of total warfare. And so that is turning inward. There is chickens coming home to roost, as Malcolm X would say. And so uh, e these tragedies are mounting. They keep happening. And unfortunately, what we have politically, because neoliberal finance capital dominates politics, what you have is these politicians playing cynical games, right? Propagandistic games, games meant to distract you from the real legitimate problem. The problem isn't just that, um, it isn't just that these events happen. It's that these politicians create an environment where the narrative around it is inherently obfuscatory. It, is, it inherently obfuscates the reality and the roots of the problem. And so we get into conversations about gun control versus no gun control, rather than looking at what is it about the society that's so sick that this can happen? And what is the role of the state in all of this, right? How does a violent militarist society with a deep state and intelligence apparatus uh, trillions worth of dollars being spent on war, subversion, and all kinds of violence, prisons, policing, all of it, trillions going into that. What does it say, you know, what does that say about the society and how it develops people who end up doing things like this? Normalization of violence, normalization of a completely and utterly socially alienated society to go on par with and in parallel with the economic alienation of capitalism because so as in in, in in so far as we can't say that okay paying gender on had you know the, i think this is a unfortunate talking point even on the right wing it's like oh well it's all about class right and the liberals do it too and even the social democrats say well if everyone just had medicare for all we wouldn't have mass shootings white supremacist shootings that's not necessarily true, right? White supremacy exists in Europe. White supremacy exists in the places where there are social, you know, these benefits. And those countries participate in wars and violence all the same. However, the social solidarity piece, I think, is much more interesting in the sense that when you have no accountability to your communities and to others, and you have a militarized culture, and you have an economic base that is fracturing, that is leading to a great race to the bottom, where finance capital steals everything, then I think you have this perfect toxic soup for mass shootings to occur and for these tragedies to occur. I think you have to look at all of these factors, look at all of them, because I don't think you can have one without the other without the other, right? And to find simple explanations for something that is complex, I think is inherently disingenuous and leads us to very narrow conversations like the ones that are being had by whatever chris murphy right uh, the the what, I don't know, what is he he's the connecticut representative or is he the governor of i don't even know right we had i think it's the i think he's the um he's a senator right he's the senator of connecticut is that who it is um yes so, yeah, so he was going viral and you have Joe Biden going off on Twitter saying, oh, yeah, we are uh, going to do something about guns, right? We have to do something. Why are we doing something? And it's like, what? 
the, the, literally you just were sending 40 billion in military weapons aid money for weapons most of which is going to military contractors to ukraine to enact and wage violence and you're lecturing about doing something when you're the president of the united states and you could executive order some kind of gun control legislation if you wanted but then again would that would that kind of regulation really make the difference right because i think what ends up happening in this neoliberal period is once the cat is out of the bag, once the forces are unleashed, right? We were talking about it in the stream, right? Once the ball is rolling down the hill, how do you get it rolling back up the hill? Something, you know, we have to think about social transformation, right? And more so revolutionary terms than these reformist terms because a problem like mass shootings, right? The people who are willing to do this, even if there was regulations, People are going to find their way into the ways into these guns, especially if you can't get rid of, right? And this is social transformation. You have to get rid of the gun lobbies and the big manufacturers. You can't allow them to exist if you're going to curb the gun violence. And that's not even to speak to what is happening in society that is leading people to take these actions. But even just at the level of how do you take the lethal means out of people's hands? Well, you got to get rid of the gun manufacturers and do we really think that that's going to happen? And then, of course, there's this bigger question that people always have. They always want to bring it up, even though we're not even in any kind of position to talk about this. And it, and it makes me a little angry that people always bring this up. It's right to bear arms. We should be able to defend ourselves from a tyrannical government. What are you talking about? You're not arming yourself for self-defense. I am 100% in support of any oppressed people, any oppressed people that is defending themselves from state violence through arms, right? I've supported all of the revolutions which require this and which continue to require it that exist and have existed in the world uh, against capitalism, right? Of course, that's not what we should, but we're not even, uh, if that's a stage we need to get to, which we will have to continue to debate. I mean, I believe that this violent society, this militarized imperialist order won't go without violence right that they're, they're going to use they're using violence already against us they're going to continue to but the conversation i don't think is about whether we need to protect our right to bear arms <laughs> that's uh, the for through the colonial kind of constitutional amendment i think the question is what is causing this who is behind what is behind it who are these people who are behind it how does this happen and we never get any good analysis from this because what usually happens with Peyton Gender, seized by the feds, you ain't going to ever see him again. There's going to be no investigation. That's going to be some kind of strange kangaroo court where he's made a political example and or the opposite. It happened with Dylan Roof. Never hear from them again. He was made an example because Black Lives Matter and all that would have you know burned the streets down if Dylan Roof got off. So he's in prison. But you don't hear from them. You don't get any investigation. You don't. You know, uh, uh, but I think we can understand through history why someone like Dylan Roof would do what he did. Same with Peyton Gender. Now, with someone like what happened with this school, right? Like this is, of course, we, we can't say it's racially motivated or anything like that. Uh, it's being painted as this like random act of violence, even though you, we've had dozens upon dozens of them uh, over the last several years alone. Well, how does this happen, Right. People have access to guns, yes. Surely people have mental health disorders, but I'm a therapist. I'm a social worker. I ain't going to blame mental health disorders on mass shootings. I think that's egregious. I think that's stigmatizing. I think that's problematic. I don't think it has a place in our discourse as a movement because it's just, it's spurious. It doesn't, co it doesn't necessarily correlate because there are so many people who don't do any act of violence despite their mental, despite even psycho the most extreme serious mental health disorders uh don't always lead to violence can but don't always but then again we still should ask the question what causes this what causes it right and how do we find that out well we can't find it out through a state that has no interest in finding it out they don't want the government it's obvious the state doesn't want us to they have their political motivations and orientation and they don't want us to find out, right? That we have to then speculate, analyze for ourselves, do that kind of homework for ourselves. But 
Uh, there are no easy explanations. For me, it's the chickens are here to roost. The society is crumbling. The empire is crumbling. It has been for the last 40, 50 years. And so this has these incidences have, have skyrocketed since then. And then you factor in with when you have these conditions of decay, then you factor in the profiteering out of it through these weapons manufacturers. And then you can kind of get a sense of, yes, there is a toxic soup in the United States brewing, and it's leading to these acts of violence, which cause so much devastation and give us the, all of this pause for concern in a moment where we need more class struggle. We can't be debilitated right, and traumatized, but that's what these acts are meant to do, right? All violence in this way cross-class violence, inter-class violence, all of it, uh, 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 violence among the general population, when it doesn't have a class basis to it, right? When there isn't a class struggle basis to the violence, it is meant to traumatize and actually harm the class struggle. And that's what, of course, that's what white supremacist violence is all about. That has a class basis to it. Usually it's targeting those people that have been identified as enemies, as whatever, you know, all of the different names, right? Is basically enemies of quote unquote civilization and they're targeted for violence. But when it is just gun violence among the population and you keep, and there is no indication of the quote unquote race factor, when there is uh, sort of the, you know, with Sandy Hook and those kind of things, you have to look deeper then. You have to look at the roots of what's happening. And oftentimes, still, these factors like racism and white supremacy, economics, like capitalist alienation, like the social isolation, like all of these various outgrowths of an empire and decline, they often play a role. And so there are no easy solutions. We can't just say, oh, yeah, take away the guns. People find a way to get things, even when you regulate something like that. So I think that we need to look deeper. And we have to understand how fraudulent it is that uh, this, these so-called government officials are even talking about it like this, because how many times have we heard it? There isn't no public, there isn't any public action. They're not actually going to respond to this through policy, through policy that will help people, right? There's not going to be any serious regulation of the weapons manufacturers. What kind of precedent would that set? They would set a precedent that they can't that they can't allow to, to happen at the moment because most of these politicians are bought and paid for by these very same corporations. And then when you talk about the gun manufacturers here, if you start regulating that, then you're talking about what happens to the government, which purchases a lot of these military weapons from the Pentagon, which are produced by these private manufacturers themselves. What do you do about that, right? So there's these can of worms, right? These can of worms that you can't open in a system that is predicated upon this violence. And so we have to continue to have real discussions about what this all means. But nonetheless, I am going to go. I do have to go. It was a great stream today. Um, you know, be on the lookout. Uh, I am writing something. So I hope to have something published either by the end of the week or next week. Um, we're going to have another guest uh, and hopefully have Margaret on again to, to co-host um, another show as well uh, within the next a week or so. So be on the lookout, subscribe to this channel, keep liking the video before you go and be sure to uh, support my work at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. That's the best way to support all of my work, weekly streams. I do a weekly podcast on call in. I do um, uh, articles weekly and I've been doing a little bit less because of the streams and all of that. Uh, to try to balance out things but the articles are still coming out principally weekly so yeah support this work patreon.com slash danny haifong it's very much appreciated as i move toward my goal and then i can stop asking <laughs> um but i'm very i'm close i'm close i'm under 100 a month now before i'm there so thank you all for all of your support as always uh, thank you for the super chats got one more I see it's mostly a comment. It says the FBI not only knows these shooters, they actively entrap them. Exactly. That's why we have to talk about this. This happens over and over again. They did it to the Muslim community during 
exactly. We got to talk about this. This is a very difficult topic to talk about, but we have to. So thank you again, uh, everyone, for coming. And uh, peace out. Take care of yourselves. Stay safe out there. And, and peace out. I'll be back with you again very soon.